Hey there, welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations about food and farming. I'm Jared Lumen, the Soil Health Lead for the Sustainable Farming Association. Today's guest is an innovative thinker who along with his partners is building a whole new regenerative production poultry system. This system combines the soil health principles and silvopasture context and provides opportunities for profitability on small scale operations through diverse and quality food products. To talk with us about this system is Tony Wells. Tony, welcome to the Dirt Rich Podcast. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, excited to talk to you and hear about what you and your friends are doing in this this really cool system that you're building. But before we get into the system that you're building, would you mind just talking to me a little bit about your background and how you got into regenerative agriculture in the first place? Um, yeah, yeah. I like to say that I'm a transplant from the city. I lived in Minneapolis most of my 20s, about 10 or 12 years. Grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis, north of the of the metro. Uh, I went to the University of Minnesota for mechanical engineering. And uh, my first job I worked after college was process and manufacturing engineer for Kemp's, uh, the dairy company. And uh, I worked at several different processing facilities uh, in Minnesota, Wisconsin. Spent four and a half years uh, working at the Minneapolis production facility uh, for Kemp's. I always, I've always been a gardener. My grandparents on both sides always had big gardens, and I've always loved growing food. Even living in the city for seven or eight years, I always had a garden. And about five years ago, maybe six years ago, I met a few folks at a permaculture gathering. And over the course of a year, I, I saw uh, Reynaldo Hazlitt Marroquin speak uh, about regenerative poultry and a system that he had been working on for five plus years um, down in the Northfield, Minnesota area. And through meeting a few folks um, over a, a year and a half of conversations, uh, we started talking about this idea to start a 40 acre farm site on one of our friends who turned into a business partner's uh, family's property. And then spent a year and a half to two years talking about this, this concept and how it could work and what, would it, what it would take for investments. And I was really looking to get into farming or production. I, I was really more interested in being involved in food production than processing in working in a manufacturing plant. So about five years ago, it was, a, it was just a, it was an opportunity. We decided that we all would invest a, a certain amount of money. We were able to set up a 20 year lease with uh, one of our partners, families on a 40 acre property to start building a regenerative farm. I, I, I spent a few years um, kind of figuring out how I could transition from the city down south um, to the Faribault and Northfield area. And, and then after two years, some of the pieces kind of just came together and, and we, were, we were ready to kind of go and we got the lease uh, finalized and we were able to pull together enough investment between uh, a couple of partners to start building farm infrastructure, a uh, road, a well, electricity, and really start building uh, some chicken production coops. That's kind of how the last 10 years uh, has, has worked out for me. That's, that's a really cool story. Not a traditional route into production agriculture, it sounds like. And I'm curious, it sounds like food was always an intentional thought in your mind. You said you always had a garden. It was always something that you were doing, not just you know buying at the store. What was your view on the food system and, and agriculture prior to getting involved with it? So I've been learning about food and nutrition for about 10 years. I grew up on a processed food diet and going through college and going through my early 20s, I had health issues and I grew up with a single mom. She worked at General Mills. We really ate most of our, most of our food came from the company store and we ate a lot. Of, we ate mostly processed food. So in my early 20s, I was I having some just various health health issues and I started literally just Googling like what goes into food or like just the most basic things. And, and I've, I've been really learning about food and nutrition and how food is grown and where it comes from for about 10 years. And in just over, over a few years, uh, realizations of like how food is produced, how food is processed and how it affects our, our health and, and just uh, like the general nutrition of, of food in our overall system. It, it was just, it really was like this, eye-opening thing for me. 
as I learned about regenerative agriculture and being able to produce food and grow food and raise animals in, in ways I had never even known about, it just through, through several kind of aha moments and realizations, I just kept coming back to regenerative agriculture, um, organic food production as what I really was most interested in. And, and, and a way that I see, have seen over and over a possibility to fix or heal various issues in the world. And so that's kind of, it sounds like maybe what brought you to that first permaculture conference that really introduced you to the people that have brought you to where you are today. Is that kind of what happened? Was that search for knowledge and desire to learn more about the food system and how that connects to human health that brought you to that original conference? Um, I, I went to uh, a couple of permaculture gatherings. I watched I watched webinars. I ended up going to the Moses and the SFA conferences for like three or four years in a row and just spent like five years learning so much about farming, organic food production, regenerative agriculture, I mean, all these words, all these things. And, and through that process, met a lot of people, a lot of new people, a lot of new friends I have now. That's a really cool story. And so then you met these folks and you got started, you found the investment, started trying to build this scalable, uh, maybe not scalable, but re- replicable uh, system, uh, scalable, I'm not sure how you would define it, but the system, what did that system look like? Your final product, you've come a long ways in the last few years. What did, what did, what have you come to as a well-designed system that allows you to do what you want to do? Myself and three others, we started off, we we invested equally to start a 40 acre farm operation. And when I came into the picture and we really started the business, Rahi and Will Crombie already had worked with a permaculture designer named Dan Helsey, and they had a 40 acre farm layout um, design completed at that time. They kind of had worked on that for a year and a half or so. And um, when I came into the conversation, um, they already had that pretty well completed. So they were looking to implement it. So when once we got this 40 acre farm site going, so we took the 40 acres and we planted barley and uh, red clover. And, and then the year after we planted um, the entire 40 acres, we planted with hazelnut trees. And that was laid out with Dan Halsey on uh, contour lines and kind of in a permaculture setting. How, how long did that take? I'm just curious. That to me sounds like a big job. In 2016, we planted... 20,000 hazelnut trees in four days. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. And then and then the following year, we planted four or 5,000 more. And that was just a day. That That's still impressive. That sounds like a full summer job. How did you manage to do that? We had about six or seven people, the four of us and spouses and a couple friends. And over four days with a tree planter and a tractor, Rahi and Will had lined up a tractor and a tree planter and and the equipment and the tools and um, we had we had people help us and we just four or five days one week we got all the trees in the ground and we just spent the rest of the year um all of those fields we mowed them down a few times and just just started the sure. kind of like green mulch so i kind of got you off track there uh i think you were kind of talking about how you built this system and you started off by planting this 40 acres to hazelnuts uh, you can kind of pick it up from there so we, we started with planting the, the 40 acres with hazelnuts and we we started over the last four years, we've planted more and more elderberries. Um, we're, try, we're trying to do as many perennial crops as we can. And then the second year we started building our first chicken production infrastructure. We had to build a road, we had to bring in electricity and we had to drill a well. We poured two concrete pads. For, for the second year and the third year, we really... We're just out there uh, working on the infrastructure, doing the, the all the labor. We did the labor ourselves. You know, we were trying to save as much money as we could. About two acres of the, the farm near the road is where we started our first chicken production unit. And then the third year is when we started raising raising our first chickens and, and then building another chicken coop. So what does this system look like? It's not like most chicken systems. It's not one of these 15, 20, 30,000 hen, you know, or barns. Uh, it's a little different. I was lucky enough to see it this summer, but would you just kind of explain, walk through what the system looks like? Yeah, yeah. So when I came into this team uh, about five years ago, I had never raised livestock before. And um, so I spent about two years working with Rehi and Naldo through emails and text messages day and night over a course of a year. Rehi taught me how to raise chickens. Hmm. And um, we, we have a, we're trying to build the outdoor ranging area. We're trying to 
replicate a forest habitat, which is the natural kind of evolutionary habitat for chickens for poultry. They, you know, evolved in a jungle habitat. So we're trying to create kind of a tree canopy so that the birds have protection from aerial predators. They have a fair amount of shade in the summertime. And the poultry just really like to range under the trees and and kind of go in and out. And so that's the kind of the outdoor spaces where we're growing the perennial trees, creating a forest habitat. Then we also have uh, many years uh, of research went into to kind of our coop, coop construction, our coop design uh, system, and then the feeding and watering systems that we use. So there was a lot of research done and a couple of prototypes uh, had been built. And then I, I came in with an engineering background and we, we, sp- we spent three years kind of going through two two more evolutions of the coop design and two questions that kind of come to my mind of what you just talked about first of all the breed of chicken um it, it's a little different than most i, I remember when i uh, was out there this summer a helicopter flew by it happened to be a spraying helicopter from a neighbor's and these chickens took off running back to the barn they're fast agile birds they're not you know just your average chicken barn that you might find tell me a little bit about the 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 breed that you chose and why you chose it for your production system i can say that uh, before i came into the team there was actually i think that they had uh, rehi had worked with probably 20 to 30 different chicken breeds the last 5 to 6 years all we have been raising freedom rangers freedom ranger broilers and they have been they've been really we've had really good results with low mortality, low health issues, almost, almost no health issues. Um, they really, they really like to forage. They really like to get out and they'll go two, 300 feet outside away from the barn throughout the day. Um, they'll come in and out, um, just resilient. It was just a resilient breed and the meat tastes great. Yeah. And then the next question that kind of came to my mind off of, uh, what you were talking about, the perennial trees that you chose. You talked about how historically chickens were forest birds, if, if I'm understanding that correctly, forest animals, and you guys wanted to replicate that, but you didn't just see that as an opportunity to replicate the chicken habitat. You also saw it almost as another income source, and you chose hazelnuts, at least in this particular situation that I saw, and maybe you can talk about other, if there are other perennial species that you have used or something, but that had to re- take some insight to see this as not just a, a system to produce a certain environment for the chicken, but as a whole nother enterprise uh, to add to this production model. So we're seeing uh, the perennial crops as uh, it, it's a it, it's a more of a longer term revenue stream, but we're seeing the perennial crops and primarily hazelnuts is what we're growing. Um, the majority of the perennials right now are hazelnuts. Will after five or seven years will be thirty to fifty percent of the total farm revenue. And and then the hazelnuts, particularly the hazelnuts, um, they require a lot of nitrogen to produce well. They do really well with the chicken manure because uh, poultry manure is the highest nitrogen content of any livestock manure. And the hazelnuts just do really well with the poultry manure and and the chickens uh, roaming underneath the trees and, and scratching the ground. And there was other um, fruit trees that just didn't do as well, uh, like apples and plums and some of those fruit trees didn't seem to do as well, or some of them even died out. Um, so the hazelnuts seem to do really well with the, ch- with the chickens. We, we see the hazelnuts and the elderberries as another, uh, another farm revenue stream. Which is just part of building a resilient system. You're building a system that, you know, the, the chickens produce the fertilizer for the hazelnuts, the hazelnuts produce an additional revenue source. I mean, it, it, it resilient to weather related storms and finance related storms because you have diverse revenue streams you've got reduced input necessary or necessities because of the you know the chickens it's a it is just such a cool design and system and that kind of leads to the next thing so you've built this system with your partners and they over years designed the system to be resilient and regenerative but in order to scale one of the biggest challenges at least I've seen so many times is marketing. I mean, in any commodity based system, a lot of times, you know, the farmer, the producer gets very, gets a very small percentage of the income that they generate as far as products. And if they're direct marketing, that marketing takes a demands a tremendous amount of time and knowledge and networking. And and it's really difficult. Plus the whole processing stage in between is something, you know, that, that also is a, a challenge. How did you guys decide that you wanted to help 
alleviate this issue of marketing and build a system that was resilient and that it provided a market as well. So kind of going back a little bit, um, we we started this 40 acre farm with the intention to build a a model production farm that could be replicated at many, many other farm sites and, and hopefully hundreds over the course of 10 years or something. And in order to make that happen, we knew that we needed to build business infrastructure necessary to be able to move and market products from, from many farms. And, and in order to do that, you know, one, one of the, one of several important factors is, is like quality and, and consistency throughout the production and the processing and the supply chain. We have really spent a lot of time invested in looking at how do we transport birds to the processor? How do we process the birds? How do we package the birds? How do we label the birds? We've, we've talked with 30 to 50 different customers in various markets you know how do you take deliveries is it refrigerated is it frozen product how is it labeled what do you need on there um, what are the pricing structures how is it delivered how do you receive how, what's the volume per week or per month and so yeah. we've really spent like just thousands of hours on that part of building the business infrastructure so that we can grow organically uh, grow sustainably with customers that align with the products that we're producing and we are we're we're getting to the point where we're ready to start working with with more farms and more production over the next couple of years. For the farmer, uh, and and you can share as much as you have established or something for the farmer who's kind of opting into this system. They're taking on this production model and they're building this infrastructure. They they enjoy their favorite part, and I, and my favorite part of farming is the production side. What do you mm-hmm. offer them as? Uh, as sort of a system for them when the chicken leaves the farm, how much work, if any, do they have to put into that marketing after the fact? So looking at the food system overall and and farmers in, in production, like most farmers don't want to market, don't want to market their product, don't want to deal with customers, don't want to deal with sales, um, deal with the processing, especially with meat processing and USDA regulations and just everything that goes into that, that end of the, the food supply chain and especially in the meat sector. So the way that we have set it up over the last few years is we actually now, and I've been talking about a 40 acre farm. Mm -hmm. We also have been working with two small farm production sites as well to raise uh, the tree range chickens that we're selling under the um, standardized production system. And we show up to the farm with the trailer and the transportation equipment. And then the farmer helps load the the birds. And then uh, we as a business, transport the birds to the processor. We um, take care of the processing. Put we bring the birds to the freezer storage. We deal with the customers. We deal with the the distribution and the sales, and then we pay the farmers a price per pound based on the final total weight from the processor uh, of the birds. So we pick up the birds and we pay based on the final weight of the total flock of chickens. Well, first of all, tree range chicken that that's brilliant. You have to have heard a, a lot of compliments on that brand. I just love it. Yeah, our business development director, Jim Kleinschmidt, just one day coined that, well, it's not free range, it's tree range. And um, that was about four years ago. And we we got like four or five people saying, have you trademarked that? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to trademark that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we, we worked through that uh, trademark process over the last four years as well. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we've had a lot. We've had folks say, even kids know what that means. I, I love it. It's, it's so intuitive. And it's just it just makes sense so i i really i do love it that's a an awesome an awesome brand name but uh i want to talk about a little bit about your why and give you a chance to maybe share with what you've shared with me and why you're doing this and that it's not just about building a profitable business for you and your partners it's about so much more and maybe share with the the origin of that mindset and that dream and, and well, what is that goal and, and the origin of that you know, it, myself and the partners have, I'm working with, we have all in different ways looked at the food system for many years. And it's really, really hard for one farm to make it on their own and market their own products. And if we it, and if we can work together with 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 farms in a cooperative way and, and share the, the, the risks and share the, the, business, uh, the, the business opportunities and the business costs and the business investments required to make, to make a kind of a food business work. It's always going to work better if, if, we, if, if multiple, multiple farms can work together. 
we're really working in a very similar kind of mission to like an organic valley model. We really want to build uh, a food business that can pay a decent wage, a living wage. That's very negotiable and what that means. But we really want to see farmers to be able to have a, a farm family make half of a living on 40 acres or 100 acres mm-hmm. um, in, instead of 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 acres with, with where like crop farming is today. Uh, you're right on. So, I, I grew up being told in this area, you need 1,000 acres per family, full-time family to farm. I mean, that's what I was told. And you're talking about doing it on 40 acres and that's just incredible. Yeah. And, and, and I've heard any and around the country, all, around the U S um, I've heard a thousand to 2000 to 5,000 acres is mm-hmm. what it takes. And, and usually with an outside income as well. <laughs> true. Very <laughs> true. Some one, one family member working in town, we're realistic and we, we have to live in the reality of, of the cost of food. And we're really working hard to, to sell a quality product at a price that's affordable that it falls within the existing market space for like organic meat products and mm-hmm. organic chicken. Well, that is just a really cool goal and it helps to, I mean, ultimately we're the sustainable farming association. And, and to me, the only way you can be a sustainable farmer, a truly sustainable farmer is if you care for your land and livestock, your resources, uh, you care for yourself, you have a reasonable lifestyle, work-life balance, and also that you have a profitable business that can carry on, you know, without you or onto the next generation. I mean, that's what a sustainable business is. And Mm -hmm. your system, what you're trying to build really does sound like just an awesome opportunity for farmers to participate in a sustainable farm business in a world uh, where otherwise maybe that that goal may otherwise be very difficult, if not unobtainable altogether. So congratulations on that, that mission and, and the steps and successes you've already had in achieving it. Yeah. Well, thanks. I, it, I haven't yet found anything I would rather put my energy towards at this point in my life. And we have a lot of challenges ahead of us in building a food business, but we have shown that we can, can do it and that we can produce a product in a kind of a standardized system and and replicate it at, at different farm sites and 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 sell at a price point that is within the existing market space. So. Well, talking about replicating and and all this, I'm excited for you. As of late, you recently got a farm of your own. And I'm just curious for a moment for you to share what are your goals and your dreams on your own farm as you, you know, you participate and you're involved in this other venture with Tree Range Chicken and all of the work that will go into that. What are your goals for your farm on your your own? Yeah, so through through my own transition from the city to mm-hmm. to the country life here south of the metro, Faribault, Northfield, Cannon Falls, I've been looking at four farmland for about three years. I've kind of been looking for 40, 20, 40, 60 acres to kind of to really build like a my own permanent home. And uh, recently, over this last year, uh, or actually the last two years, I met a, a family who. Uh, had 240 acres in uh, the, their family trust, and uh, some of the family members wanted to see the land go out of conventional agriculture and towards organic, regenerative agriculture. The family was uh, working through, for a couple of three, four years, was working through a state settlement, and um, there was they had three parcels of land, three 80-acre parcels, And I worked with one of the four siblings over the last two and a half years to uh, work on a uh, out of purchase agreement for the 80, one of the 80 acre parcels. Part of that was that my intention was to have uh, access to to 40 of the 80 to start building a farm site. And we, we closed on one of the parcels last year, November in 2020. And uh, I've spent the winter so far, little by little, working up a farm plan for, for myself here. And um, actually, there's still another 80 parcel across the road adjacent. And I've also been working with three friends. I've talked with about 10 people for the last couple of years, working with three friends right now on possibly buying the other 80 acre parcel too. So hoping over the next year or two to have anywhere from 40 to 120 acres here to start building a farm site. And and I've really, for five years or so, I've really been interested in pasture-based livestock models. 
I've always loved eggs and chicken and I, and I really liked lamb as well. I've, so I really want to raise chickens and I really want to raise sheep. That's kind of what I want to work towards the next couple of years here. And then hopefully uh, I will be able to build a home site in two or three years as well. Well, I, I love just hearing your talk about, I mean, it, it sounds like partnerships and cooperation and working together with people is a big part of your vision and with everything you've done. So that's, that's really cool. And I'm, I, uh, being a grazer and pasture-based farmer myself, I fully support that mission and, and goal for your farm. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do, what you do with that, as well as the tree range chicken brand and what that's going to do for so many lives and so many farmers starting off here in Southeast Minnesota, but we'll see where it goes. Is there anything that you want to talk about that I've missed something on what you're doing with your 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 farm or your this tree range chicken brand that that I haven't talked about that you would like to share with our listeners? Yeah, we well, I guess I would say the biggest development for us in 2020 is that we were able to purchase a processing facility for poultry with a nonprofit partner, and we are working through 2021 here to get that facility up and running. And it's it's directly south of our area. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's 20 minutes south of Austin, Minnesota. It's right on the border of Iowa and Minnesota. And it's a, it's a poultry processing facility that was in operation from 2010 until 2017. It's still fully stocked with all of the original equipment. So we have a lot of work ahead of us on that, on that front, but we are hoping um, over this next year, 2021, 2022, to be able to start working with 10 or 20 or 30 farmers um, and processing chickens at that facility. That's awesome. And and if people are interested in learning more about what you're doing or reaching out because they want to be a part of it, where would you direct them? Um, actually, we have a, we just are getting a Google form put together right now. And I can share that with, we are actually, we're going to be sharing that with uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa, with Moses, and we would, we'll share that with SFA Network as well. Um, and it's a, it's a basic Google form, um, just asking farmers questions about uh, processing poultry, numbers, times of the year, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of packaging they're looking for. All right. Thank you so much. And what's the website? Is there a website for the, the, the farm brand and the chicken brand that you're building as well? Uh, yeah. Uh, you can visit www.regenerationfarms.com. Our, our info email is listed on that website. And you can find more information there. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Tony. Really appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe that agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer Network, visit us at sfa-mn.org.